today we're going to have a, a kind of a fast pace, a little bit about our, our own cities, our own EMS systems, and uh, some alternative ways of, of funding for the fire department. My name is uh, Manuel Chavez, and along with my president of Local 341, Jeff Kanan, we'll give a, be giving a presentation. Everybody, I'm sure everybody knows uh, Gary Ludwig, Chief of uh, Deputy Chief of uh, uh, Memphis, right? Yep. Uh, pretty popular. He's going to start off the uh, the presentation. So. Huh? I'm not popular. <laughs> I'm always one step ahead of Electric Man when he comes to shut it off once a month. So. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here with my esteemed colleagues from Houston, and um, we're going to obviously uh, talk about uh, EMS fire-based scenarios um, on funding issues. And um, one of the things <clears throat> that I've done um, is kind of did a compilation of um, some of these uh, events and stories and methods that I've been able to discern from around the country. And so uh, my presentation will first will be kind of a compilation of all those different events and different types of funding sources that you can use to help fund your fire department. So I guess one of the questions I want to ask the people in the room here is uh, how many of you have more money in your fire departments than you know what to do with right now? You do? Well, we want to talk to you, so. Sarcasm, okay. <clears throat> um, where are you from? Kansas City, Missouri. Smokey has tons of money right there, right? Yeah, so. Well, actually, uh, that's one of the things we want to talk about today, because I think, <clears throat> did not Kansas City, Missouri actually pass the dedicated tax um, to specifically fund 1710, and uh, along with that, then um, did you not? Um, then you added more stations and manpower and that sort of stuff as a result of that, or how did that? Okay, I don't know if everybody can hear him or not, but and we're we're taping, so I'm going to repeat what he said. He said, but um, the um, basically. Um, the, uh, they upgraded stations with the funding, and uh, instead of some of the cities that are doing rolling brownouts, what they've been able to do is sustain their operation and keep everything operational. And also, um, was that did I cover that, or was there something else I missed? Yeah, everything's been kept on pace. Yeah. Everything's been kept on pace, and your operation pretty much has been sustained. Then, so, so that's that's one methodology. Then we're gonna, we're kind of talk, talk about that. We're talking about dedicated taxes, for that sort of stuff. But you guys actually put a campaign issue on the ballot. And uh, is that how you did it, if I recall? Yeah, that's been several years. That's been several years ago, so. Okay, but that's, <clears throat> that's some of the innovative, out-of-the-box thinking that some departments are doing um, in these difficult times. And actually, there's a little bit of foresight on that because, uh, you know, that was before the economic crunch happened, if I recall, you guys passed that tax, so. So uh, anyway, we're gonna kind of move on, but, <clears throat> you know, the bottom line is, I think we all know that the citizens call us for 911 regardless of what it is. And, Unless there's been a crime committed, typically we're going to be called um, and we're going to have to respond and we're going to have to deal with the issue. And uh, we've become everything from firefighters to EMS personnel to social agencies to, um, to uh, rescue um, veterinarians uh, for, uh, for uh, animal type of events. I mean, you name it, hazardous material. Anything, that ha <clears throat> anything to do except for crime, and even in some cases we're getting called for that when you respond to a scene for a shooting or some other type of crime-related event. So when somebody calls 911, um, we continue to uh, see an increase in our call volumes. We continue to see an increase of demand for our services, <clears throat> but <clears throat> at the same time, we don't see too much of an increase in funding. And, and so in many cases, we've seen funding decrease dramatically. And so uh, as a result of that, we now have to find out where all that funding is at because no government agency truly has adequate funding. And I kind of said that tongue in cheek a little bit earlier uh, that, um, how many of you all have too much money and you don't know what to do with it? And I, and I do know some fire departments. Oh, let me, can I get that microphone? I'm going to step away. Can, um, hold on. Okay. <clears throat> I said that kind of tongue in cheek before. There's, we know that, that Fire departments are distressed right now. Government agencies are distressed when it comes to funding. And so I do know of some departments that are doing exceptionally well, and, but those are the exception more than the norm. So the bottom line is I think we're all taxed and we're all, uh, no pun intended, but we're all um, 
you know, to the point where we don't know where our funding is going to come from at some point. So, and so our city managers and our city leaders have now started to basically look at other ways of cutting fire departments, including privatization. This is one headline from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch where they talked about uh, privatizing the EMS is one option under consideration, and we see that going on all over the country. We see brownouts, we see department cuts, we see uh, a variety of different things, firefighters taking pay cuts on their <coughs> salaries and pensions, other benefits. We see a variety of different things occurring. <clears throat> and so we have to start, as I say, we, we can't cut on, we can't rely on bake sales anymore. And that's kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke, but at the same time, we can't rely on bake sales anymore because uh, we have to look for alternative forces. For, uh, we have to think outside the box. We have to be innovative. We have to think about other sources of funding. So because unless you're a fire district, anybody here from a fire district? I'm just curious. You're from a fire district? Fire protection district, yes. So you have a dedicated tax specifically for your district probably, right? That's correct. We're directly up against the private sector, so they're the providers. Okay. So, that's kind of the so you do have some competition then? Yeah. Our district is 70 to 28, strictly as a fire district. Strictly as a fire, it's Ventura County Fire Department okay. in California, so it's strictly a fire protection district created by ranchers back in the 28th. So, so the EMS wasn't a factor at the time, so they're trying to reinvent it. Okay. But we're right up against the private sector. But, <clears throat> but you're not competing against the dog catcher and the other city agencies for funding. That's correct. You got a dedicated source of revenue, typically. That's correct. But, but you do. You got, you got challenges in, within the district because the privates are trying to take some of that revenue away. So, but the majority of us in this room, it looks like, unless you're from a fire protection district, your departments are competing against the health department, against the street department, against the dog catcher. For there's X amount of dollars in that pot of pie in the city. And so your departments are competing against those individuals, those, those other city agencies for that money within that pot of pie. And as, I'm going to be just blunt and tell you as much as we'd like to say that, hey, it's public safety and it's, you know, issues that concern people's public safety and their health and other issues like that. The bottom line is, um, is that politicians sometimes don't look at that because how many times does a citizen in your community in the course of the year call 911 for, for a fire or for an EMS emergency versus how often do they call uh, if their street lights are out or if their garbage doesn't get picked up. Let the garbage go and pick, on, not picked up for a week because they get their private garbage picked up every week, right? They might not call 911 every week. Well, in some cases they do. But, uh, <clears throat> but majority of citizens in your community, they don't call 911 every week, but they get their trash picked up every week. They drive on the streets. So if there's a lot of potholes, your city leaders and your elected politicians are getting phone calls. If their street lights are out, if the garbage doesn't get picked up, let the garbage go unpicked up for a week and see what happens. So they know they got to keep their constituency happy. And that also includes making sure that all their basic services are taken care of besides public safety. So we can, we can talk about public safety and we can, you know, stand on our laurels and all that sort of stuff. And, but the bottom line is the politicians still looking at keeping this, their constituency happy, their voters happy, and making sure the trash gets picked up every week. So we're competing against those other city agencies. Now I know sometimes it's difficult for us to comprehend this because we don't, we like to not think about money. We don't go out and <clears throat> screen somebody's wallet when we go on a call and think, okay, you're, how much are you gonna pay us for this? <clears throat> or if we go on an EMS call, we're not screening them and putting them through some type of uh, background check and through some type of credit check and also checking their credit cards and make sure they can pay for this call. So it kind of goes against our grain and our values about time and labor when it comes to charging people. So we don't like to think about this, but at the same time, we're at a period in time where we really need to start thinking about other sources of funding. So this is kind of a review, but there are different types of property, there are different types of taxes out there, property taxes, local income taxes. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> I've been trying to stress in Memphis is we have, I forget how many thousands and thousands of people that come into the city of Memphis, and we're strained right now. We had a $60 million deficit last year in our budget, for the, not for the fire department, but for the city. And so the city funding, the city funding is strained. And so one of the things I've been trying to advocate is we got thousands and thousands of people that are coming into our city every day that don't live there, but they're coming in there to work. And they're coming in there and they're using our city streets, they're using the fire department, they're getting protection from the police department, they're getting a variety of different site types of city services, and they're not paying for any of that. 
they're, you know, they're benefiting from that. And so some communities have you know, what they call a local tax or some type of uh, earnings tax. It might be 0.25%, it might be 0.5%. Um, I know St. Louis is 1% of your paycheck goes back to the city. So uh, again, that's another source of funding revenue. And that's one of the things I've been trying to advocate and try to tell the city leaders in Memphis, but, but um, I, there's been opposition with that because some people believe that the state law prohibits that. So you might need to check your state laws and um, determine if that's a feasible thing. But that's one of the things that, that I think we need to do in Memphis. And uh, you know, if you think about it, all these people are coming in and getting all these services and not paying for any of it. You know, and if they go to Subway and buy a sandwich, okay, they say, oh yeah, well they're buying, when they come in there, they're buying stuff. Well, buying a five hour foot long at Subway, you know, and, and paying, uh, you know, maybe 25, 30 cents tax on that or whatever they're paying on that is not gonna cut it when it comes to trying to, to uh, fund our fire departments. You have general sales taxes, you have transient taxes, you know, a lot of those deal with uh, hotels that will charge a certain amount for, um, for, um, for tours and that sort of stuff. And then you have dedicated taxes. And we just talked about that, like in fire districts, they have a dedicated tax. Kansas City, we have a dedicated tax specifically to fund the fire department for 1710. I know, uh, anybody here from Las Vegas? Las Vegas has a dedicated tax for their fire department. So anybody else have a dedicated tax in here? Where are you from, sir? Uh, I'm from Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Okay, so you have a dedicated tax. Mm -hmm. Okay, taxes on the phone bills are dedicated. Now, here's what I want to tell you is important. Don't let the politicians, just because you get a dedicated tax, and let's say it brings in, I'll give you $10 million. That doesn't mean they can take $10 million out of your budget and transfer it over to the dog catcher now. Don't let that happen. Because that's the other thing that can happen. Just because you got a dedicated tax doesn't mean that um, that uh, um, that they can cut your budget, and then that other that other funding source comes from uh, from uh, that dedicated tax. Because that's one of the things that can be a detrimental thing too. So it just means that what they're doing is they're using that ten million dollars and transferring it somewhere else, and keeping your basically your budget still the same. But it also helps to fund your budget because then <clears throat> there's a, there is a there is an advantage to that because it helps fund your budget too, and the fact that you're still not competing for that $10 million against that, that's a dedicated tax, a dedicated source of revenue, and you're not competing against the dog catcher for that money. Here, these again, these are all things that departments around the country do, borrowing, um, basically it's bonds, you sell bonds for purchasing capital equipment and facilities. Anybody sell bonds, capital bonds, um, for capital equipment, okay, that's a typical funding source. Did you have a question, sir? Okay. Something, and it's also you're borrowing against taxes for the future is what you're doing there. So some departments are leasing. They're leasing their, uh, I think, anybody from Phoenix here? Phoenix does a lot of leasing. They, le they lease not only their fire trucks, but their vehicles, the SCBAs. They lease a lot of their stuff. And then they have the option of buying it at the end. And, uh, or, right, or the right to purchase at the end. But typically, you know, typically it's going to be um, obsolete by that point. So typically they just go and get new equipment. So it's a new, f it's a new source for uh, funding their equipment. So. But these are all ideas. <clears throat> How many of you do EMS transport in here? Okay. Now, I assume that you're, you know, we live in a very litigious society. We have lawyers suing us all the time, not suing us, but suing other people all the time that have been involved in auto accidents, other types of untoward events. And so what they need is they need those records. Um, they're they're going to subpoena those medical records, the patient care records that you're involved in, and use those in, your court docu in their court documents for their lawsuit. And so how many of you get re requests from attorneys in here for, for records? And I guess the question is, do you charge for that? You don't charge for that, okay. You can typically, you can get, do you charge for that? How, how much do you charge? $30 for one search? or For one run ticket, okay. I know some departments that are charging $100 per page. 150 bucks, okay. So, and you're not charging at all? Notarized, okay. Okay, but anyway, it's, 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 it's not gonna make you rich, but it's a, it's a funding source. They may fund at least that clerical position in the course of a year. So it's something to think about. But uh, again, uh, I know of some departments, like I said $100, and some who said $150, $150, okay. I know some departments that charge $100 per page. And, um, and these lawyers are gonna pay it because the bottom line is they need that piece of documentation as part of their lawsuit. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, but okay. The the question the question on the floor is is not <clears throat> not a public record. And don't they have access to it? Uh, I think it's protected by HIPAA. You know, I can't just call you. Just I can't. If you got transported and had a medical situation, I as a citizen I can't just call up and say, hey, I want to give. I don't know what your name is, sir, but I just hey, give me his medical records. I can't. I can't do that. They have to subpoena those records. Pardon, Sunshine law wouldn't apply under that scenario. So a Freedom of Information Act or whatever you know would be the yes. getting that record. I mean, that you could charge them for copying expenses and, and search expenses, uh, even though it is a public record. Yeah, and that's an excellent point, is even though, it, even, let's say that they, they want a uh, fire report, or they want um, some other recommend, you know, they want all your payroll records or whatever, it's, up, it's, it's within your right to charge them a reasonable and, and customary fee for the research that you have to do for your clerical staff to put that together, so, all right. So uh, again, that's, I, I think it's protected under HIPAA and you just can't release that. But again, it's another idea for a funding source. Oh, going back. And again, these, there's all kinds of federal money out there too. You have uh, the assistance for firefighter grant, the metropolitan medical response system money. Uh, if you're especially in, a, in an MMRS area, you have the uh, urban search area, search, uh, the, US, uh, the USC money, basically the urban security area, or urban area security initiative. <coughs> And again, that's dedicated only to sometimes to some metropolitan areas. I think you asked, you just cut down on some of the metropolitan areas. You got safer money out there. Um, the only caution I want to tell you is I think this federal money is starting to dry up and it's getting harder and harder to get. So, you know, as, as Congress looks where they can cut, unfortunately, they're looking to cut in these particular areas. And I know they just wiped a bunch of cities off the UAC initiative, UAC initiative. So, um, again, but you have to have some good grant writers out there. And uh, some of these grant writers are very good at what they do. Um, this is, I, I hate to use this word here, but this is mostly for volunteer fire departments, but, but it's applicable also to, uh, to uh, career departments, and that is that you have um, a federal excess property program where they have excess supplies or excess material, typically from their wildland initiatives, and, uh, and they have those types of programs and surplus available to you. So a lot of times it's military vehicles or other type of equipment they use. So, so that's another area you need to be looking at. Now, this, I, this, I have this slide pretty generic because it fluctuates, but basically um, there are a variety of different programs under the Department of, Department of Transportation that are EMS-related funding. They, they vary from time to time on what they are. Mostly what they're concentrating now right, on right now is the EMS for children or EMS for children type of programs. So some of that grant funding is available there, and you have to do some research to find that. And, uh, and you have to try to, uh, again, have a good grant writer that you can uh, try to get those programs. This is one of my pet peeves. The asset forfeiture money. <clears throat> uh, the cops walk away with all the money. If they go in and they seize drugs, they go in and seize vehicles, they go in and seize the money, the cash from a drug you know, sale or raid of a drug house, who gets the cash at the end of that? The cops, right? Because <clears throat> the idea is that basically they're the ones that are dealing with the drug problem. And I'm like, time out, wait a minute. You know, the fire departments deal with the other half of the drug problem. We're the ones that have to deal with the overdoses. We're the ones that have to deal with the shootings, the crime-related event that occurs because of drugs. Uh, we're the ones that have to deal with the other scenarios that are outside the crime ring, uh, crime event, uh, or I'm sorry, outside the drug event that is not crime-related. So why don't we get some of that money? So that's always been one of my pet peeves. So if you want to try a strong initiative and try approach uh, your elected officials, your other people within your community, see if you can get some of that asset forfeiture money. Maybe you're not going to get 50 percent of it but maybe you can get a vehicle or maybe you can get something out of it. Maybe you can get something out of the asset forfeiture money. And my argument is, hey, we got to deal with the other half of the drug-related problem. So anyway, that's one of, my, one of my pet peeves. A lot of states have funding sources. I know uh, in Memphis, uh, we ha I'm sorry, where well, I'm in from Memphis, but the state of Tennessee, there's, uh, there's state funding for training. It goes back to uh, the individual firefighter. If they complete so many hours within the course of a year, they get $600 for state funding or for training. It comes out of the state, fund, or state funding. Um, and the other thing I want to tell you is that some of these states have warehouses full of equipment, tons of different types of equipment. Some of it might be applicable, some of you won't, it won't be, but they have all kinds of surplus equipment that they put in warehouses. I know when I was in St. Louis in Missouri, I had a huge warehouse up near Jefferson City, Missouri. And, and you're from Missouri, obviously. Uh, anybody else from Missouri at all? Okay. But um, 
they have all kinds of uh, tons of different types of equipment that you can go in there and for basically pennies on the dollar purchase equipment and surplus equipment. Casinos, uh, how many of you have casinos in your, in your areas? Do you get any funding sources from those casinos? But there's a tremendous impact they have on your community and uh, because of the call volume and the other events that occur with that. So, because uh, what are they, what are the casinos mostly attract? What's, what age category? The elderly. And so typically you're gonna see a higher call volume as a result of that. So I know in some communities, again, uh, St. Louis has a dedicated tax from the casinos that are dedicated strictly to public safety. Uh, again, that's a dedicated tax, but it's a funding source that comes from the casinos. Again, it's something you have to do legislatively within your community and change it, but it's an opportunity for you. Spiller pay laws from hazardous materials. Again, there's EMS type of events that occur with them. You have to set up decon, you have to do other types of events. There might be some exposures, you have to set up rehab. Um, again, all that is funding sources that is typically reimbursable under the spiller pay law, uh, if you have a spiller pay law in your community. Anybody have spiller pay laws in your community? Okay, where you get funding sources back if somebody spills some hazardous materials, you can send them a bill for that. Anybody not have that? Or anybody not doing that? I don't know if it's federal law. Uh, I know a lot. Hmm? What happened? On the Sarah Title III type of stuff? Or CFR 1910 120? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if it falls in those federal laws. Typically, I see local communities enact legislation like that to recoup the uh, funding from it. Does anybody know, is that a federal law? Here, that's the. Uh, for the hazmat, if their ordinance in their town is an update, dated frequently, maybe like every five years, you go and it goes to court, the lawyers will beat it up and they end up not recouping the cost. So you have to make sure that it's updated. Yeah, so I guess your, your local ordinance is piggybacking off the federal law is what you're, what you're doing then. Okay. Pilot programs, uh, that's a called, you know, that's basically an acronym for payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, you have some probably organizations within your community that are exempt from taxes. Typically churches and colleges and nonprofit organizations that are, that are exempt from taxes. But they might have a tremendous impact on your system. Um, I, you know, sometimes colleges, um, a huge college or university within your community uh, might have an impact on your system, if, per, particularly if you get a lot of calls there. A lot of, maybe you get a lot of alarm soundings, maybe you get a lot of medical calls, whatever you get there. But you can set up programs like pilot programs for payment in lieu of taxes. Anybody have a pilot program here in your community? Yes, sir. Where, where do you get your, wh who do you have, what, what, uh? You, you get tax, the, the politicians get tax abatement and they get uh, pilot from the tax abatement. And, and the, the actual, the, the pilot is higher than they, their actual property tax would be for the municipality. But because they're abated, they don't have to pay school tax and they don't pay county tax. Okay. And that's where they go to the Okay, but in the long run, they still get, you're still getting taxes back to the municipality. The municipality gets the get some money. They order to the taxes. Okay, all right. Anybody, um, again, have an opportunity in your community where you see you have a large call volume at some type of place, but they're not paying any taxes. Anybody have that scenario in here at all? Nobody? Okay, but think about it, there probably is, and maybe you don't know about it, but think about it, there probably is something. Um, again, we talked about surplus vehicles and equipment. Typically, you can get these at low cost or no cost. Let's talk about private sources of funding. Um, foundations. There are over 25,000 philanthropic organizations and foundations in the United States that are just looking to give money away. And... Um, I know when I was in St. Louis, we were able to get about $375,000 from the Episcopalian, the Presbyterian funding, I can't think of the name of it, to buy monitor defibrillators. Uh, one of the things that, I'm, and I'm in Memphis now, there's a, a group called the Assisi Foundation, and it's a, cha it's a Catholic charity organization, and they're just looking where they can give money away to help and better the health of the community, especially, particularly in urban areas. And so, uh, you know, one of my plans somewhere down the line is to try to approach them and try to set up a public access defibrillation program uh, and act, you know, to basically try to raise the, uh, you know, survival rates within our community. But again, 
If you look, there are 25,000 different philanthropic organizations out there that have funding sources and they're just looking sometimes where they can typically, typically have some good, do some good, and, uh, and basically uh, you know, contribute back to the community in some way. This Episcopalian Presbyterian Society in St. Louis when I was there, um, again, they sold a hospital and they're not allowed to make any profit off the sale of a hospital. So that what the, what the profit that came in off the sale of that hospital was put into a charitable foundation and basically they use the interest, whatever else they can gather off that each year to basically, uh, you know, to fund these different types of uh, notable or, or charitable types of things. So again, if you check, but um, you know, they're very large sometimes, they're local and uh, they're community organizations. And again, they're just looking where they can give you money at. So um, to apply for the funding, you gotta research potential targets or foundations. Uh, they might be local, they might be national. Uh, research your needs and define your objectives because you just can't walk in the door and say, hey, give me some money. That's not going to work. So you have to have a letter of inquiry. You have to start off with a letter of inquiry, see if they're interested, kind of open that door, put your foot in the door. And if they're interested, you got to make a proposal. You have to make a decent proposal. You have to write up a nice proposal that looks very professional. And you may have to go and make a presentation to the board of directors. But typically, if you have a good cause and you're from a, again, you know, fire departments, Usually what we do, it's for a good cause, you know, what we serve our communities. Typically they're gonna be looking to give you money for that type of uh, event. So corporate donations is also um, uh, a feasibility. They can either give you cash or in-kind services or equipment. This is, uh, when I was in St. Louis, this was a, uh, a, an old beer truck that basically was donated by the, uh, the local uh, beer distributor from Anheuser-Busch and we turned it into an air truck. They even painted it for us. Uh, I know in Memphis we uh, we just converted some uh, buses to uh, to patient transportation. We bought a thirty-five thousand dollar kit from a company called First Line Technology through our MMRS funding, actually, and uh, and we converted. You can convert uh, these these buses, either school buses or public transportation buses, to carry eighteen patients or more. And so we got the buses donated by our local company there in St. Louis, or not in Memphis. And uh, as a result of that, now we have. Uh, through, we have two large patient transportation carriers that each carry 18 patients. They painted it for us, and, um, and we, that was at zero funding because we funded it through our MMRS system, and also we got the uh, people to donate the in-kind or the equipment to us. So, but this is an example of some things you can also do. And you say, okay, well, that's cool. You know, you're getting, you're getting some equipment, but what is that, you know, how does that benefit us? Well, that's money that you don't have to dedicate in your budget to some other type of resource. You don't have to go out and buy that. So you can use that back, that money that stays in the budget for, for staffing or for pay or other issues. It, all these are, these might not be directly going to salary and benefits and other issues like that, but at the same time, it keeps the money back in the pot of pie uh, to, to uh, make sure that happens. So again, here's another picture. When I was in St. Louis, um, the local uh, Monsanto company, uh, they had an old foam, foam truck. It was very usable still, but they donated it to the fire department. And when they got done with it, they even painted it for it, lettered, lettered it for us. So, again, there's again, it's opportunities out there if you were to reach out to individuals. Other fundraising methods: um, entertainment events. You can charge for standbys, or sporting events. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many of you standby sporting events, uh, or if you do that for you spend sort of. Do you charge for that? Okay. How much do you charge for that? Okay, where are you from? Baltimore City. Baltimore City. Okay, you got NASCAR in Baltimore City? Baltimore. Where do they fit that at? <laughs> hmm? Inner oh, it, oh, the Inner Harbor's got, yeah. the Inner Harbor has NASCAR? No, it's just for all the Yeah, Grand Prix. Yeah, Grand Prix. Oh, okay. It's not the real, I mean. No, it's not a track. Oh, okay. Track. Okay. Yeah, they they run, through run through the city. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so anyway, but you're, you charge your for sporting events, or for other types of standby events like that. Anybody else, anybody here going to standby events and not charging for that? Okay, we have some. It's all right, we won't, we won't pick on you. You can raise your hand, so. But, uh, okay. Okay, all right. You work with Lloyd Rummert there? Lloyd, uh, Hambo? Hambo? Okay, he's got that new barbecue thing called, uh, 
and what is it, muddy something? Okay, anyway. All right, uh, and Henrico County has that then, all right. So anyway, that's another type of a, a, an opportunity to raise some funding. Um, movie productions. I don't know how many of you have movies that are, are made in your community, but sometimes they want to use your vehicles within their, um, their movie productions or they want you to stand by. Uh, you should be charging for that. That's an opportunity, again, to bring revenue back into the community. Um, yes? Uh, do a lot of that, but it's interesting what our guys do. We also, we, we, the, our fire department doesn't uh, officially do that, but our guys are authorized to be private contractors. Oh. But they have to be trained by the department. And so a lot of it's, in, it's, it's sort of an uh, overtime opportunity for our guys. It would be nice to be able to draw money because there's lots of production in there, but it's pretty tough because there's other unions you have to deal with with uh, SAG and everything else. So it's, it's very complicated to, to, to get money for that. I assume that's probably that way out in California a lot, but yeah. I know when they've come to St. Louis and Memphis, typically we, you know, the last, or equipment that you know, one of the ones in the, in the movie, there was one recently done called the Grace Card uh, that was filmed in, in, in Memphis maybe about two years ago, whatever it was, and they used some of our ambulances and we were able to charge them for that. So they also wanted to use our people to stand by, we were able to charge for that. So, but it's probably a little bit more complicated when you get out to California and Hollywood and where they do a lot of movie production type yeah, of uniform. Different. type of different type of uniform. Yeah. Okay. Now, I've heard of this before, advertising ads on, the, on fire stations and vehicles and message boards. Uh, and I've heard of this before, but I can't, I went on the web trying to find anybody who's doing that. Um, you know, the you know, typical joke is, you know, is, would you allow, allow a lawyer to advertise on the side of an ambulance, you know? Or would, uh, can the funeral home advertise on the side of the ambulance, you know? But, um, but I've tried to find some pictures on the web, and I've heard of this before, but I can't find any. Anybody know of anybody doing any advertising like that on the side of their vehicles? Minneapolis did? Cell phone? Okay. Okay, hold on, let me get you on record with that. that just uh, just south of us, Chesterville, Virginia, they had uh, the cell phone logo. It was Verizon or it was Nextel. They donated the cell phones to every fire truck for them to use. Um, say someone broke down the side of the road, they would have a cell phone in the engine. Or they'd be able to use it on calls and things like that. So it was there. Um, so they allowed them to do some advertising at one time on their truck. Okay. And, um, and would you say Minneapolis did that? What would they have on their trucks? Hose bed, or logo ads and the hose bed covers, okay. And they got funding, so they, they, were, they were basically paid either with in-kind services or paid for that, so. So anyway, that's another idea for funding sources, so. Now, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm gonna ask this question because I find out sometimes I'm shocked, and I find, how many do, if anybody does it, ambulance transport in here and does not charge? Okay, you don't charge, okay, and you, and you don't charge. Where are you from? Baltimore County. County? Baltimore. Baltimore County, okay. Yeah, I find that a lot on the East Coast, especially Maryland, those types of places like that, because um, there's just resistance because the volunteers fight that. Is that what's happened in your community? The volunteer? Okay, so you're doing ambulance transport and not getting any revenue for that. And where are you from, sir? In Rico County, Virginia, again on the East Coast. Made the decision. Okay. Yeah, they, the Board of Supervisors, the elected officials say, hey, that's a service we provide, we're not going to charge the transport. Man, you know, when I, pay my, when I pay my insurance premium, you know, when I pay for my health care, uh, that's included. The insurance company's building that in there. So unless you're getting that revenue back from the insurance company, your community is losing. You're paying for that benefit. You're a beneficiary of that insurance company, and I'm paying for that benefit, and if you don't get that benefit back to your community, they're, they're, all you're doing is making the insurance company richer. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, the New York State law. And then uh, the emergency power in the state, which is sort of weak, and, and you know, any time you get Whistleblower. It would be forced on by the board of Metro money, uh, you get insurance coming back, and they had to pay the whole. Yeah, because there's something to do with the New York State law, isn't there? Right. Make sure your legislation's good. Yeah, so 
But anyway, I, I, it's amazing how many I find people that are not billing. So, but these are your typical Medicare, uh, your source of revenue, Medicare, Medicaid, third party, and self-pay. Those are the four typical sources of revenue. And again, if you're not billing, uh, you need to start billing. And I'm going to say, not only are you, if you're not billing, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. The documentation has to be good. If you're not documenting well, if your medics aren't documenting well, they're losing money. If they're not capturing signatures, if they're not capturing Social Security, Social Security numbers, if they're not capturing Medicare numbers, Medicaid numbers, that sort of stuff, you're losing money. The important part of, of getting revenue back is documentation. Because Medicare providers and Medicaid and all these third service providers, private insurance companies like uh, you know, United Healthcare, they look for opportunities to deny payment. And if you're, if, for instance, if there's nothing documented that the person was on a stretcher, that's an automatic denial in many cases. So it is important that you document, 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 and have good documentation or else you're losing money off the table. So it's not only the transport the component, but it's also you got to document uh, so well. Yes? I repeat what he what he basically said. Go ahead. Yeah, we're gonna, I got a slide, but I'm going to repeat it here. What he had said, and that is basically in Las Vegas, uh, they're capturing the automobile insurance, not the health insurance, part of the automobile insurance from both parties in an accident, and they're billing the auto insurance company, and especially if there's a technical rescue or some other type of, or, you know, fuel spill or something like that probably got a graduated type of schedule is what you got. But he said as a result of that, they brought in about $250,000 in Las Vegas. As a they, were that. they were missing that, so. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, uh, I'll talk about this briefly. Um, if you're billing in-house, typically you're losing money too uh, because there's a lot of technical expertise that's required to go into billing. There's, there's laws that are constantly changing, and regulations and guidelines from these different insurance companies. They're constantly changing things. And so typically what I found is, is those that are doing in-house billing, they're losing money. And you can, there's different ways of doing that. You can out, you, I, I recommend outsourcing it. And uh, you can typically do that as a flat fee percentage, a percentage fee of collections, or you can do it on a contract fee. Hey, now Gary, this is what this gentleman was talking about. Yes, Jeff. Could you, how many people are, are doing in-house billing? In-house yeah. billing. In-house billing. Yeah, I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, the question is, you got people that are in-house um, that are, um, you know, and, and sometimes you can transition them to other jobs or you can do it, do it through, through attrition. So that would be my recommendation. So, but um, at the same time, you're going to find typically um, that you're going to, you're going to substantially increase the revenue coming in if you outsource the, um, and I know a lot of people might not be a, a, a proponent of that, but I'm telling you what I've seen, and that is that if you outsource uh, I think Baltimore. You from Baltimore? You were doing in-house at one time? <laughs> oh, really? Okay. 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 What did it do with your revenue? Did it go down or go up then? Yeah. Went down. Okay. Because of the virus. Okay. All right. I, I think that might be the exception to the rule because if you didn't have the virus, you probably... But at the same time, you have to make sure you get a good company. So I would say that. So, all righty. Auto extrication, we just talked about that. Um, here's another source of revenue. Subscription programs. Some fire departments, particularly up in the Oregon area, are um, um, 
what they're doing is that they have a subscription program. You can buy a subscription, and if you call for the transport of the ambulance, they will waive the deductible because you have a subscription. That's called the Fire Med program, and typically up in the Springfield, Oregon, that type of area up there. Anybody from the Oregon, Washington area? Okay. Yes, you are? Okay, I think it's more typically down in the southern part of Oregon is where it's at. So I always associate Washington and Oregon together so they're so close. But, but, um, but anyway, it's called Fire Med. And it's uh, typically Springfield. I'm trying to think of the other big city near Springfield, Oregon. Eugene, Oregon, I think that's what it is. So, so anyway, but that's, that's another idea for revenue source. And, um, you know, it, uh, hold on a second. Just one second, sir. Um, what, what happens again is typically if you call for a trend, they're gonna still, you're still going to bill the insurance company. But since you have a subscription from them, you're going to waive their deductible is what you're going to do. And typically, the revenue is more substantial if you were to collect the, rev or to cl uh, collect the deductibles. Yes, sir? Okay. Oh, well, subscription programs? It was in Tennessee. Yeah, they, let the they let the place burn. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was. For, and that was a volunteer fire department. Was what it was. They let the house burn down. So, but there are subscription programs out there. I see them for helicopter programs, and I know there's fire departments up in the Eugene, Oregon area, uh, Eugene, Springfield, Oregon area. They're doing subscription programs. So, um, I'm going to move along because I'm probably cutting into your time a little bit. So, all right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here you can do the rest of these slides. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to talk about this. The, the healthcare industry has done a 180. Uh, we, you know, we we have moved from a consumption to a conservation type of system. You know, they used to put you in the hospital and you would stay there 50 days if you had a bypass. You know, they, and they would bill for each day and they bill for each IV and bill for each. But what's happening now is insurance companies have said, wait a minute, we're just going to give you a flat X amount of money, and what's going to happen is it's up to you then to get that person back on their feet and out of the hospital. And so typically, someone has a bypass or some other major operation, what, ha what happens? How fast are they out of the hospital? Days. And the reason why is because, one of the reasons why is because the, the hospitals are only getting X amount of dollars from the insurance companies for a procedure or some other type of event. It's up to them to manage that money. So if we move from a consumption to a conservation type of system. And so um, these are some models that I've, I'm aware out there, again, uh, that are um, are possibilities for you to work with managed care providers. Uh, what this will displays is you have the managed care provider, the fire department, and you would contract with the managed care provider to basically do uh, prevention type of programs, injury prevention, safety inspections, and teaching self-sufficiency. So again, you would have to reach out to your Medicare, or not your Medicare, but your different health providers for that type of thing. They might be looking for those types of services because they're looking to keep people out of the hospital. Non-emergency transports. Now, typically, you don't see fire departments doing this, but I see more and more fire departments exploring this. Interfacility transports, specialized mobile intensive care, joint ventures with air transports where you have to move the patient from the helipad to the hospital, that sort of stuff, and long distance transfers. I know Bangor, Maine is now involved in doing interfacility transports. They, uh, again, the, you know, with what we see typically privates doing in the past. Um, that's a source of revenue, and it's usually guaranteed revenue because the doctor has to sign off on that transfer. So uh, it's almost guaranteed. When we go on a 911 call, it's not guaranteed revenue. But if you do interfacility transports, it's darn near guaranteed because the doctor is signing off authorizing that transfer that they have to go by ambulance. So did you had your hand up? Or, or yeah. About 40% of, of our revenue comes from interfacility transports. We're in a small community, so we have to transfer, you know, to... Junction City, Kansas, so we have to transport, you know, to different facilities. But if you don't have the documentation right, especially on non-emergent transports, you won't get paid at all. So, yeah. Again, the documentation is so important. Anybody doing interfacility transports in here at all? Where are you from? Oh, Kansas City. I mean, you know, my memory is not what it used to be. Believe me. <coughs> because of mast. All right, mast ambulance was uh, a quasi-private. Uh, EMS, yes, run by the city, and um, it was a trust. And what happened was, after the, uh, the private provider was left, the fire department ended up taking it over, but they kept the transfers and everything else going. 
we don't do out of the city transfers or anything out of our own area, we just do that, but the only problem we have right now is it was originally set up where the money doesn't go to the fire department, it goes to the city coffers. Oh. So now we can't get a change, it doesn't go actually to, to the fire department, but it goes to the city coffers. Yes, but that's what we're paid out of, so. Uh, and you guys got actually an ordinance, I think, in Kansas City that you're the only one allowed to do any facility transports in the city, so. So you you got a pretty good of a lock then, so. Did you have your, who had your hand up on inner facility? Okay. Is, is the city of Richmond running their own ambulance service now? The public utility? Okay, I didn't. You're right. Okay. When Jerry Overton left, okay. What was coming, yeah. Public utility, public utility models of the day are going bye bye So, um, you know, and we saw that in Kansas City. I, I know Oklahoma, Tulsa, they're looking to try to get, the fire departments are working there to try to get take over transport to get rid of the public utility models in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Richmond went bye bye uh, There's only a few left. Uh, you know, you got Fort Worth, you got Pinellas County, you got Reno. Those are some public, those are the Jack Stout days of, well, it, it's high performance EMS. EMS. You're right. Is is it sucks? Yeah. Well, it, it was just it was just a guise basically to use fire department resources to make money for profit or for privates is what a profit for privates is what it was, and it was developed by Jack Stott, an economist that had no EMS background is what it was. And he based it off an elevator concept to be honest with you. So, you know, and, and thankfully he's gone, and so are public utility models going to the wayside too. Because they, you know, the people would have to sit in the ambulances at bus stations and, uh, you know, 7-Eleven lots and all kinds of stuff and high utilization hours and all that sort of stuff. So it sucks bad. So anyway, but uh, non-emergency transport, Bangor Maine is doing this, and they use, uh, they actually have firefighters that come in on overtime, on their off days, on overtime, and they are the ones that do the interfacility transports. And actually, the city is still making, I think, in excess of 250,000 hours a year. With that program, so there's you know there's two hundred fifty thousand dollars in excess coming in, even with paying somebody a time and a half, uh, basically on their off day. So, and I don't again, um, you, I know you're doing interfacility. Anybody else doing interfacility transports? Okay, and you are. Okay, are, where are you from? Uh, Rich Richmond. That's right, Tampa, Florida. God, you know I can tell my, my memory is just going. We already went through this. Kansas City, Tampa. Okay, and my wife wonders why I, I don't remember what she tells me. So, at least that's what I tell her. So, that my memory's going. And some actually have government contracts with the VA where they transfer patients to. Um, now, if you're not doing transport, anybody not doing transport in here? Okay, we have a few, okay. Um, I know in California, especially a lot in California, you have AMR and Rural Metro and you have some other private organizations. The fire departments that don't transport, they're actually, they're using our resources to stop the clock. And, uh, what we typically see um, is that they're using our resources. We do, if you look at the components of an EMS call, majority of, the, of what is happening is done by us. The only thing they do is they transport at the end of it. And we may, they might even put one of our people in the back of their ambulance to transport that patient to the hospital. And who gets the money at the end? They do, because they did the transport. So some of the fire departments, I see this a lot in California, they have formed agreements for first response with, uh, with the, um, with the private providers that they, the private providers, I know in a rural, I think it's Colorado, uh, Douglas County, which is Aurora and some other areas like that. And also they have those types of agreements where they are paying money back to the fire department for first response. And uh, again, does anybody have any type of agreement like that in here? Okay, yes. You know, that's an excellent point. Um, if, if you have a private uh, uh, provider in your area and they're under contract to provide service, if they don't meet their response times, are they paying a fee back to you for, as a penalty? Anybody have that? I know Las yeah, Vegas. Yeah, sure. Well, we have a number of penalties that are currently scheduled. Go ahead. For items that they get uh, uh, things that are in the contract that they, they don't meet their goal, it's not just response times, but as well as bringing the gurney and their equipment to the patient side.
Yeah. Okay, so yeah, penalties against the private providers is another thing. And, I, and I, I just thought about this. When we talk about documentation, how well, I'm gonna go back about you know 10 slides, 15 slides. We talked about how important it is to document. Does Las Vegas, do they still pay the medics for uh, extra money for completing the document? Oh, did you? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was kind of cool because first you were incentivized to transport somebody. I thought, man, you'll never get a refusal in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> you want to go to the hospital? No. Well, you're going. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. But it was a benefit for many of the guys who were bill getters. Right. Uh, employed, uh, and I'm, I'm sure some guys made substantial money on that. But so. we know that we had to make a step to the next level. And really okay. So it's not there anymore. Okay. I thought that was pretty innovative. So. It probably worked a lot better than threatening them to not get Yeah. Yeah. Probably worked a yeah. Lot Sometimes you get more done with the honey than you do with vinegar. So. Okay. Hey, Brent. Exactly. Yeah, it was. But I thought it was kind of cool. I'm surprised it went away. But anyway, let me move along because I'm cutting on these guys' times. Um, if, if you do uh, presidential details, the Secret Service will pay you for those standbys and those types of uh, provided coverage that you do for that. I don't know if you know that or not, but they will pay you for that. Uh, parades. Um, sometimes the organizations doing the parade will pay for you. Um, Vehicle registration fees, sometimes uh, there are dedicated taxes within communities for vehicle registration fees for EMS. Um, also hand-me-downs from other agencies. Um, I don't know if that's sometimes welcome, but sometimes it's an opportunity. Some people charge for CPR classes. Um, again, here's some value, here's some models that I've, uh, I know of around the country that, again, are value-added fire department selling services. You have the a doctor's office that has an independent practice organization, say a, a cardiologist's office. So instead of them, um, um, you know, it's almost like the home nurse type of program. You have a visiting, you know, fire medic or something like that. But they might go in there and do an in-house, uh, in-home EKG, 12 lead. Uh, the fire department might also do lab work, and that all gets sent back to the fire or to the uh, health care provider, the independent, independent provider. Uh, this, is a, this is a fire department assessment engine model. I think this was used in um, Portland, Oregon. They contract it with the Oregon Health Services Science Center, and um, the nurse call would take the 911 call, you know, the call and nurse type of program. And if uh, there was a need, they would send a paramedic engine out there to assess that patient, and that money was paid back directly to the fire department for that. Um, these are some other things you can get involved in immunization models. Uh, again, you might have a managed care provider that wants to do some immunizations. Maybe your health department wants to do some immunizations. And um, I always, you know, you can contract with the fire department. And you can do the in-house, you can provide uh, flu, sh flu shots or other types of immunizations inside the fire station or the patient's house. It was always my idea, especially if you got an engine house that has a front and a back door, that you create a drive-through on a Saturday, uh, drive-through and get your flu shot type of thing. And the Medicare will pay for that. That is the only thing that Medicare will pay for for non-transport back to a fire department is for flu shots. And so they will pay for that. And I don't know how many of you live in rural areas, but there also are fees for ALS intercept services, too. Anybody do ALS intercept services here? Okay. With that said, uh, I want to give you some, some websites that are good for looking for grants, firegrantshelp.com, 
and emsgrantshelp.com. Those are websites where, again, you can do research and look for grants uh, if you have a grant writer. We talked about grants earlier. With that, I, I thank you because I really cut into their time and I apologize. So I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleagues from Houston. So thank you very much. And I'll be around for questions. Thanks, Gary. Welcome. Now you're going to get the South version from people all over the world, but uh, Texas and Houston, Texas, we're, uh, we do things a little different. Uh, we've been doing EMS quite a while. Uh, we uh, have it from uh, the uh, OEC, our, our dispatch center, all the way to uh, ALS uh, and BLS transports to the hospitals. So we have patient uh, contact from the beginning to the end. Uh, Dr. Pepe was uh, our medical director. Our medical director. Dr. Pepe was our medical director who started uh, our system. Uh, how many years ago, Jeff? 30 years ago. Today, uh, Jeff Kanan, to my left, is our, our president, Local 341. Uh, he's also a paramedic. Uh, we'll give you uh, a little uh, perspective of how we're doing things and uh, a little different uh, perspective of what we plan to do in the future uh, on alter alternative funding. Uh, everybody, uh, like Chief said, uh, finding ways to bring money in. Uh, we're looking toward the future to see a different way to to be able to generate and support our our EMS system. So, good morning. Um, first, we're going to do a, a sort of a quick overview of the system we have in Houston and how that works, and then we're going to segue into uh, where we're going. We think in the future. Uh, so, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the system. Uh, as Manuel said, it's a, a little over thirty years old. Um, the city of Houston is, is about 613 square miles. Um, we have a tiered system, first responder, uh, for, uh, with the heavy apparatus, and we have BLS, uh, transport ambulances, and then uh, we actually have BLS. For, uh, almost everybody in our system is at least an EMT. There's only a, a little less than 100 folks who aren't EMTs uh, in the Houston Fire Department. Um, so we have the systems tiered with first responder uh, heavy apparatus, BLS and ALS transports, and then we have what are called ALS squads. And those are uh, uh, about half, uh, half transport capable, and the other half are, are uh, suburbans with two paramedics who go out and do patient assessments. The idea is to keep uh, our ALS folks, uh, uh, their, their uh, unit hour utilization down and keep them available in their uh, still alarm territory. Um, let's see, like I said, 30 year history. We've got uh, more than 2,000 state certified EMTs and, and uh, 500 nationally registered uh, EMTs, paramedics. And uh, annually we make around 150,000 transports, 144 this last year. That's the population of uh, what, Tallahassee just right. about every year. Uh, go ahead, next slide for me. Uh, this year, uh, we faced a greater than normal economic uh, challenge, as, as I'm sure everybody in the room uh, did. The city of Houston had a $100 million uh, budget shortfall. Um, the annual budget for the fire department's uh, right around $450 million, and we were asked to cut that budget by 5%, right? So it's about $23 million. 95% um, of, that, of, of that budget is personnel costs. So as you can imagine, it didn't take long before the conversation uh, turned to layoffs and, and, and furloughs. Fortunately, uh, when this came up, we were actually in contract negotiations or starting contract negotiations, and most of this was dealt with in collective bargaining. What we did was just uh, push back uh, the way some of our, our uh, termination pay gets paid out, and it really just uh, uh, gave the city the opportunity to, to pay it out over time and save the money on the front end. Also protected a lot of benefits that we negotiated over the, over the last uh, several bar bargaining cycles because we didn't give anything up except just, just the, the delay. Okay. Um, actually, I think we'll switch here. You'll <coughs> Traditional solutions fall broadly into two categories. We, you're asking us, well, you know, everybody's going through economic times, hard times. Uh, how does that have to do? Um, 
with funding. You know, uh, we were looking at uh, a short period of time where we had to either uh, reduce uh, our cost or find other ways of funding. Um, like Jeff said, our uh, collective bargaining helped us to, to find ways to reduce our needs, our cuts, and, and, and efforts to, to reduce the, the required cost of running the fire department. Um, but one of the biggest things was that uh, our, our fee collection rates. We, uh, I heard somebody mention ACS, a third service. And I also heard some of y'all talk about, um, well, that reduces the manpower, the people that we have. Uh, in Houston, we utilize our manpower in, uh, with the ACS collection agency. We do have it outsourced, but uh, we're able to utilize our members not only to um, create the programs, but also to um, maintenance them and, and able to teach the membership, uh, uh, our members, how to use the laptop. So we, uh, we have a large, <laughs> a large group of firefighters and, and personnel that we uh, work with ACS to, to gather that, uh, uh, that estimated of $300 million that we could gather from our, from our uh, uh, collection. Uh, right now, we're at $65 million that we collected a year. And like some of the uh, members mentioned that uh, they paid a collection, I mean a, a fee to the, to the members to be able to um, document the, uh, the information correctly. Uh, our firefighters were able to work with ACS to develop a program in which they had certain required fields had to be um, filled to be able to uh, close out the, the, the document. So, and then we were uh, able to access this information not only to better collections but also to uh, as a, uh, a Q&I and a Q&A scenario to be able to get the information. We uh, developed classes, our members taught classes on how to better document, so that was a better utilization of our manpower. <clears throat> we saw an increase in collection rates uh, because of, uh, of, of the laptop. ACS turned around and said, you know, when we first started, uh, we're gonna give you all laptops, so all our, all our units uh, were given free laptops to better, uh, better access the information. Uh, ACS uh, offered us a, a faster collection rate, uh, accurate information, statistical data. Like I said, it helped us to uh, be able to uh, understand a little bit better what we were doing out there uh, in a much faster rate to be able to correct it if we were doing things wrong in, in uh, our billing. Uh, and recouping a larger percentage. Uh, every year we've gone up in collections. Uh, I think we first were like at 15. Uh, we're now at 48% of, uh, of our billing, so it continues to go up every year. Um, that helped us a lot. And also supplemented some of our other um, efforts to generate some funds, uh, MBAs, hazmat fees, uh, charge for services besides transports, which are usually, we're looking into, you make the call, the diabetic, the one that uh, you give the amp of D50, start the IV, and the patient says, I'm fine, I don't need to go. Well, we, we're not recouping that. In, uh, in Memphis, for example, they charge a base fee of $150. Politicians ain't really that glad to do that. They're, they fight it every time we, we bring it up for a, uh, for a fee out in, in the field. They said the, the, their constituents don't like paying double or paying taxes. So they're, they fight it often and uh, we never get to get it uh, changed in the ordinances. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, one of our problems that we face is a, is a I mean, I've heard a couple people mention it in here, the idea that, well, you know, this is a service that the city provides and so we don't charge for it, right? Uh, we, we just had a, a, a fee increase on ambulance transports in the city of Houston, turned into a huge political football um, because people didn't want to go up on the fee. The city of Houston was charging less than any other city in the Southwest, you know, because it just it, it hadn't gotten touched for years because of that, because of two things, the, the political climate and then the, the sort of cultural uh, belief that, you know, we're already, we're already charging folks for this service, and so, you know, we, we can't charge them anymore. So we looked for other ways. Um, some of the ways that we found was the academic partnerships with uh, some of the colleges, some of the medical colleges, uh, um, research programs, um, hospital partnerships with Memorial Herman Hospital, uh, uh, stroke studies. 
they were able to not only train our personnel in advanced care, but also supply some of the equipment. But the biggest one that we had was the private industry research with Zoll. Uh, they did a huge um, trial with the uh, Autopulse, a um, CPR, which they in turn at the end of the trials uh, gave every unit a, uh, an Autopulse and the batteries and the equipment that went with it. So uh, that helped us, uh, helped us in the CPR of our manpower and so forth, but uh, it, it, was, it was free. And so next, next really what we want to talk about, I guess, is to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, I think a lot of what we talked about up to this point uh, overlapped with, with what Gary had to say. Um, we're having a discussion in Houston about what to do next. Uh, we've talked about all, those, all the different ways that you, can, that you can generate revenue, whether it's taxes or grants or, or uh, fees for service or whatever. Um, but we're, we're entering into a discussion about what's the, next, what's the next big thing in EMS and what do we do next? And we think the answer is coordination and cooperation rather than competition. Um, I think there's a, there's a place uh, where our, our jobs overlap with the health department and with some other city departments. And rather than competing with those departments, that it's time for us to look at ways to, uh, to coordinate our efforts. And that's not just a discussion that you know, Manny and I cooked up. Uh, that's actually a discussion that we're having with fire department management. You want to? We came up with something that was called a, the CAPS program, a citizen assist program. So like you know, like you mentioned, some people don't know who to call when they get there and their, their stepmother or somebody's going to be ill and can't take care of themselves. All we do is we call this CAPS program and they come out and they will actually assist. The fire department, get them we have a over $400 million annual budget for the fire department. And we're, we are about 25% of the overall budget for the city. The police department is um, one third of the budget. So together, the police and fire almost takes up 60% of the total budget for the entire city. It's amazing. So um, if you just look at, the, at what we do, the fire service, we don't do a very good job, once again, of explaining our services and then describing it in a, in a way to politicians and then getting support from those politicians for um, things like fee for service. And I think that's what you're talking about. If you think about it, in the and, and I hope I get this right, but in the seventies we started the fire American Fire Service started paramedics. In the in the eighties it was hazmat. In the nineties it was technical rescue in the Oklahoma bombing. In the early two thousand it was it's a homeland defense. Now the biggest issue we have is social service calls. A lot of our calls people just call because they don't know who else to call. We, we are, our firefighters spend a lot of time just listening to the people's issues, trying to solve their problems. And they, they're not emergent, although they appear to be urgent to those people. So we need to be, do a better job of figuring out how we're going to manage these calls. But at the same time, we have done a really good, really bad job of providing information and try to get fee for service. Because most people feel I pay my taxes, I want the police and fire to show up. And so uh, that's, that's really been the, the biggest part of the discussion, and, and that's really kind of, I think the video walked on what you were saying at the end. Uh, we all, everybody in this room has, has to deal with the fact that people will pick up the phone and they call 911 when there's nobody else to call. And uh, traditionally, that's, that's, that's been a, uh, a real, reality of the job, but it hasn't been something that we really planned around or planned for. And we're advocating, you know, a better plan and really I'm, I'm hoping for, I know we're running short on time here and I'm, so I'm going kind of quick, but I'm hoping for some discussion ab about that because I think uh, we're having the discussion and we think that's the direction that, uh, that we need to go in. And we think there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more to be gained by cooperation and, and coordination of those efforts than there is 
in the model that I think most of us are in right now, which is competition. Um, obviously, there are some challenges to that. The, uh, there, there are the internal challenges. I mean, I'm, I work in a department that is absolutely an EMS department that makes fire calls, okay? 82% uh, of the calls we make, I think maybe even more than that, maybe about 85% of the calls we make are EMS calls. I have people who are hired after me, and I am absolutely a rookie in Houston, but I have people who are hired after me who say, well, I got this job to be a firefighter. Well, of the 300,000 calls we make in the city of Houston, 50,000 are, are, are working fires. Okay, I like fighting fire too, but the reality is, it's, is for most of us, we're EMS departments that make fires. Uh, so we still have that internal cultural issue that we have to deal with, and certainly if you're gonna expand the role. Um, the external cultural issues, uh, people think firefighters fight fires. Uh, we still, in, in the city of Houston, after doing EMS for 30 years, roll up on the fire truck and people say, I didn't call for the fire truck. Um, so, again, I think some of that goes back to what the chief said about getting our, our message out to the public about what it is we do and, and why we need the, the tools and equipment we need to do those things. Um, obviously, it requires some effective coordination between, uh, in, in, I guess, the, in the case that we're talking about, the health department and the fire department more than anything else, um, and proper resource allocation. And at the end of the day, we're still gonna be the people who deal with emergencies. In, in the city of Houston, when I talk to uh, uh, political leaders, I make, I make sure they understand that in, in the city of Houston, there's the Houston Police Department, Harris County Sheriff's Department, uh, every, every school district has a police department, there's constables, there's the Texas Department of Public Safety, DEA, FBI. You know, if you put an overlay on the map for every law enforcement agency that responds, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, overlap. But if you have a fire, an EMS emergency, hazmat, uh, uh, technical rescue, uh, plane crash, I mean, there's only, there's only one department that responds to all of that in the city of Houston, it's the fire department. So um, that's still gonna happen. And when we're, when we're talking about a discussion, when we're having a discussion about how you uh, expand this role, uh, that still needs to happen. You know, we, folks are still gonna expect when they call 911, that we come and we make it better. Um, if, if, I may, if I may sure. also, you know, we, we look at it as saying, um, we're looking for alternative ways to, to generate funds, but we also have to, in, in, in times uh, like today, we have to find ways to, to justify our, our job or, or what we do. Uh, we change, in Houston, we changed to an all hazards response within the last three weeks. And the difference is that uh, now the engines and the ladders have now been classified as EMS apparatus. Uh, the dispatch now are, are being dispatched to these calls uh, alone. The fire truck goes, the ladder truck goes, uh, and even an ambulance goes by themselves, a transport unit, to assess the situation and then determine if it needs an ALS or a BLS, um, where they would be making maybe one or two calls a tour now they're making anywhere from eight to 15 calls. Uh, I know it's, we, we get a lot of from the firemen saying, man, that's not fair, uh, you know, you're making me do EMT work, and, but it is an assimilation, a combination of the work to justify to the politicians, to the citizens out there to saying, you know, we've, what are we paying these guys at the station? Because that's the argument that the privates use. It's the argument of the guys that are wanting to cut uh, the budgets in the fire department, uh, the pensions. Uh, who are coming in, the people who come in after our pensions. You know, these guys are, are doing nothing or staying at the station and not uh, justifying their job and getting these unbelievable paychecks and pensions when they retire. Uh, we've changed the way we, we deliver our service, um, thereby showing that uh, the need for, for more increase in budget funding uh, because we do more and this is just another way to look down the, down the road and say, okay, what else can we do? You know, what else can we do besides, I remember uh, HPD finding new ways to generate uh, revenue. They created a, f a department just for trucks, for 18 wheelers going through the, through the interstates that these, these uh, uh, trucks would pull them over and uh, uh, inspect them and find them and all that revenue would go back to the city. They were finding ways to, 
to create new departments for the future. Uh, in the fire department, uh, we just, we sometimes become complacent and decide that uh, EMS and, and fire are the only two things, hazmat and rescue. Uh, and, and that's why the, the, the discussions are now, what else can we do? You know, some of the retiring uh, firefighters, some of the older firefighters who have been paramedics for 25 or 30 years who are unable to lift the stretcher or carry the, the equipment up the stairs or fight fires, <coughs> we talked about, and I think Dr. Pepe talked about uh, developing a response unit to, to do the other, the flu shots, uh, the assessments of the, of the households, the, the care for the uh, uh, mental patients, the uh, mental health patients. Uh, we have what we started is called a focus care program, and I think most of the departments have that now, in which we have um, returned customers, so to speak, that uh, call you almost every day, if not uh, twice a day. It's called the loyalty program. The loyalty program. <laughs> the loyalty program. <laughs> and it, it, so, you know, we, we have a form we sent in. Uh, the uh, health department, along with the university and the um, uh, hospital system send a psychiatrist, a nurse, and a social worker uh, over to that patient's house uh, and, and find out why uh, why that patient why that patient uh, uh, has been calling 911 every day, and uh, about 80 percent of the time uh, it corrects the issue because they find out what the problem is. So, um. well, you know, look, we're through the looking glass on this, and we get that. All right, if you if you're uh, and, and I. That's pro probably less so here than in other cases. But if you are, you know, uh, one of those one of those people that's saying, you know, I joined the fire department to fight fire, this is obviously not going to be something that you're interested in doing. But the reality is, you're doing it right now. You're doing it most. Like I said, everybody in this room that's involved in the EMS has got the same exact problems that we have on a smaller scale, and very few of us are planning for it or preparing for it. And as a result. We're not, we're not planning for or preparing for how we're spending the money or making the money that we could be off of an issue that's not going away. And so, um, like I said, uh, we, th th this may sound like it's kind of a uh, funny topic to bring up in this discussion. I, I mean, in this, uh, with, this, with this topic, it sounds like a funny discussion. But I think it's a discussion worth having. And so I know we're running real short on time, but I'd like to to take some questions and have a little bit of discussion back and there's a hand up in the back of the room. Hang on one second. I'm going to give you the mic because they are recording this. That's right. Uh, well, you mentioned social service stuff uh, with Kansas City Fire and EMS. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, this, this is good enough. Okay, all right. Uh, We've been operating for three and a half years now, a program they funded initially with Robert Wood Johnson money. They put about a million bucks into it, along with a half a million from uh, other agencies. It's not just Kansas City now, it's metro-wide. But in partnership with uh, United Way's 211 service, we have something similar to what you're talking about in focused care, but much more extensive. It provides a nurse and social worker who will respond on anything we refer. It does not have to be a frequent flyer. It doesn't no. have to, to be a psychiatric case. Uh, we encourage our personnel that anything they run into when they enter a citizen home that they think requires care beyond what we provide by charter, all they have to do is make a very simple referral. It's a, a little three-line um, email kind of thing. And within 24 hours of that, a nurse and social worker will visit that home, make a complete assessment, network the entire uh, uh, United Way system into it, plus, of course, the government resources involved. Within one tour of duty, they will get back feedback on the response and what's been done with the, the patient and client. It's effective enough that, uh, you know, for a while we had guys calling to find out what happened to the person they used to see every day because, you know, they're, they're kind of missing them now. But the, the issue beneath it is that we have to solve these kinds of problems, but they're not our problems to solve. There are eyes and ears. There are other systems set up for it. I know RWJ is wanting to put a significant amount of effort into replication of this, looking at fire and EMS as one leg of it and the local United Way system as the other. Most of the, especially the major metro United Ways that are operating the 211 access system also find value in this. 
in that it provides them a way to target their resources and make those resources effective. For most of the people we encounter, it's not that they don't have a health care home, it's not that they haven't tried to access social services, it's that they become invisible clients. They're not particularly attractive clients to serve. And the standard fire service approach is, uh, you know, we kick ass, take names, and make something happen. When we put these referrals in, these people become visible. They start getting uh, the services they're supposed to be getting and to network them together. I guess the bottom line is if it takes nurses and social workers with 25 years of experience pulling their hair out to figure out how to make it work for these people, they're not going to be able to make it work without assistance. So the idea of putting case advocacy on the ground, we've found to have tremendous effect, and we know there's support out there to replicate that in other communities that are interested. Thank you, Doc. That's, that's an excellent um, perspective there from, from a doc, but uh, it also saves you money, the department money. Uh, it keeps... We have to make a million and a quarter into year one operations. There you go. Yeah, and that's, that's actually what I was going to say. Our, our, it's around a million dollars is what we're thinking as well. And so um, it's, it's difficult to track. But again, it's the, the reality is we're all dealing with it without a plan, and that really doesn't sound like a, a way to, to do your business. Do you have any more questions? Or? Jeff, we also have a um, tele-nurse or tele-care nurse yes. uh, that, we, that we utilized uh, that helped uh, the, the amount of calls, because as, as we all know, the calls continue to grow, and our, our equipment and manpower to, continues to dwindle, so trying to find ways to uh, reduce the transports, to reduce the, the uh, uh, dispatches, uh, telecare nurse. Um, we did it for a, a year now and saw a reduction in uh, the transports uh, dramatically. I think it was like, what, 12 to 15 percent over a period of six months. So it, it, it had helped. Um, Doc also talked about uh, uh, developing a focused care. Uh, we, we're planning to do it a little bit further in there and, and further out with that plan and to, to create a unit that would go out uh, to these calls on the day calls uh, instead of sending out a, a transport unit of the ambulance or an engine. So that's planning for the future. It's Any other questions? CE e. at the end of the table. And if you can uh, put your name on it and get some CE credit, she has it right at the end. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.